Chautauqua 2011 is made possible by funding from the We the People program of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, I'm Angela Rice Beamer, here at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College for a living history program called Chautauqua. Chautauqua programs are both informative and fun. Scholar actors portray first-person accounts of very important people in history, and tonight's Chautauqua character escaped from the horrors of slavery, but returned to rescue others at least nine times. She had a humble spirit and an unshakable faith. Tonight's Chautauqua character is Harriet Tubman. Well, praise the Lord. Y'all made it. <laughs> Well, we got a couple of more hours before we start our journey, so go ahead, sit down on a tree stump or a rock, rest a spell. We'll leave around midnight. Sky's nice and hazy. Moon's not too bright. Oh, it's bright enough to see the North Star, but it's not so bright we'll be seen. <laughs> Let's see, this is Saturday, and your master won't even realize that you're gone until Sunday. And there ain't nothing he can do about it till Monday morning. So that leaves us what? Oh, about, about a day and a half worth of road between us and them paterolas. And them paterolas hunting us down ain't the only thing y'all got to worry about. So everybody pay attention and listen up. Now this is going to be a hard trip that we starting on. You're going to be tired and hungry, cold and scared but we're going to keep on moving. Because <laughs> if you stop, you die. You see, my job is to get my people to the promised land of freedom, and I intend to do just that. So if you can't follow my orders, you want to turn back, <laughs> you best do it now. Because once we get started, there'll be no turning back. You got to move or die, even if I got to shoot you myself. See, I, I, I can't have nobody going back. And the master beating them so bad, they ends up giving up the secrets of the Underground Railroad. That would hurt all of our brothers and sisters that are trying to get to freedom. You see, freedom is a hard-bought thing. It demands a high price. It's not bought with dust or words, empty promises. It's bought with oneself, the bones, the flesh, the spirit, and once you've got it, cherish it. Now we got to go free, or we'll die trying. <laughs> Shh, y'all hear that? That was our signal. Seems like we got a couple of more passengers be joining us. That signal sounded a bit far off. Well, I, I guess it'll be a while before they catch up. <laughs> So some of y'all didn't hear that, did you? Well, you see, I pays attention to what others might ignore. When I was a youngin, my dad had been, he, he took me into the woods and swamps and he taught me how to walk quiet. He used to say, daughter, any old body can go through the woods crashing and mashing things down like a cow, that's easy. But you, girl, I want you to practice doing it the hard way. You be so quiet that not even a bird on a nest to hear you and fly up. <laughs> Took me some time, but I learned. I remember one time I snuck up on Daddy, nearly scared him out his britches. <laughs> but you know, we never did talk about why it was so important to be quiet. But deep down inside, I knew. See, for a runaway, the, the difference between life and death could be in the quiet. But... Even with all its dangers, Lord knows I'd rather be outside on the God sky than cooped up inside. But my first job was inside, working for Mrs. James Cook, dusting and cleaning, picking up her yarn. I was five years old when Master Brodus rented me out to them. Can you imagine that? Five years old. Now, Mrs. Cook, she was a weaver. She spent hours and hours cooped up in this, this tiny little room, bent over a loom, her arms always moving back and forth. Oh, I hated being cooped up in there with no air to breathe, always 
picking up her yarn and, and, and winding it and winding it and, and her always calling me stupid and lazy. She told me I wasn't even worth having around. I remember the first time she, she sent me outside to help Master Cook set his muskrat traps. It was, it was so cold and I was so scared. I was just a little bitty thing myself. I remember I, I sang to myself to keep me from being so scared. My father, how long? My father, how long? My father, how long would you let suffer he? I remember I, I got out of that water and I fell to my knees and I said, Lord, you know, it isn't right for him to treat me like this. I'm doing the best I can. It, it just never seems to be good enough. I want to go home, please. Just make them send me home. Oh, and Lord, why are you at it? Could you convert Master Brodus? Oh, God, change that man's heart and, and make him a Christian, Lord. Convert Master. I got real sick with a fever from being in that cold water, and they sent me home. Mama took real good care of me, got me well again, but as soon as she did, Master Brodus, he ridded me out again, this time to another white woman. I was to watch her baby. <laughs> she told me that my job was to make sure her baby never cried. <laughs> now, those of y'all with youngins know that ain't no easy job. <laughs> I was forever rocking that baby, either in my arms in the cradle, and there wasn't but a little bit of thing myself. I rocked that baby day and night, night and day, back and forth. But well, the same thing would happen every time I, I'd rock the baby, and well, then I'd fall asleep myself. <laughs> but when that cradle stopped rocking, that baby started wailing, and Miss Susan picked up her whip that she kept behind it. And she beat me so bad all the time that finally I just ran away. But I only stayed away five days because I got so cold and scared. I had to go back, and she gave me a really good whip in that time and sent me back to Master Brody's. So there I was, five years old, on my way back home, sick, scared, tired, and in pain. I'd done the only thing I'd know how to do. I'd done the thing that my, my mama and my papa taught me to do from a, from a cradle. She taught, they taught me to pray. So I said, Lord, please don't let Master send me back there. Now, now you convert master, and you convert him now. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Well, I, I didn't mean to tell you how to do your job. <laughs> Lord, make me more patient. Lord, make me more patient. Lord, make me more patient until we meet again. Patient, patient, patient until we meet again. Well, I wondered, just like all of y'all have, I'm sure, if this was all life was meant to be, I needed some hope. And then one day, I heard a story about a slave named Tice Davis. 
Now this story was told and retold in the slave quarters, in the fields, even up at the big house. There, there was an old woman that got too old to, to work out in the field, so she took care of all the youngins in the quarter. And she gathered us around and she told us about a slave named Tice Davids who ran away from his master in Kentucky. But his master, he got wind of it and he ran after Tice. So he was always keeping him within his sights. So Tice, he had, to, he had to jump into the water and swim the river. Oh, but his master, his master, he, he hunted him down in a boat and he, <laughs> he seed him. He see them reach the shore, no more than a whisper between them. And then, all of a sudden, Tice just, <laughs> he disappeared. <laughs> like sweet cake in front of starving children. <laughs> now, his master, oh, he was puzzled, greatly confused, more than he cared to admit. He said the Tice <laughs> must have gone on an underground railroad. <laughs> But you know, when I first heard that story, I was puzzled. Was there really a road that ran under the ground? Was that how Tice escaped his master? And if Tice could find this railroad, why couldn't other people find it too? Why, the free Negroes, the Quakers, the Methodists, the German farmers that helped runaway slaves in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, well, they started using words suited to the railroad. They started calling themselves conductors and, and station masters and brakemen. And their houses and barns and haystacks with all those secret passages were known as stations and depots. And the runaways were called passengers, parcels, boxes, bales of black wool. You know, when I was a little girl, I believed that there really was a steam train that went through a deep underground tunnel between the south and the north. And when a slave boarded it in the south, oh, they'd be free when it come up out the ground, snorting and puffing and leaving a trail of cinders behind. <laughs> if you get there before I do, coming for to carry me home, tell all my friends I'm I'm coming to, coming for to carry me home. Sing with me. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Oh, freedom! <laughs> I thought about it all the time. And then one day, I got to meet my own version of Tice. Oh, I must have been about, about 14, 15 years old when, when I saw a man, a, a slave, trying to run away like Tice. And, and that overseer, he saw him too. And he followed him. And so did I. I watched him as he took that hound dog and it went after that man. And, and I, my mind started thinking about what the old folks had told me when I was a youngin. And I remembered their words and I wade in the water. Wade. In the water, brother, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, God, wait in the water. I kept singing so that the man would know what I was trying to tell him. Wait in the water, brother, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. That overseer, he, he caught up with him down the road a piece at the crossroads store. And he grabbed his whip and he yelled, hold it, boy. And then he told me to, to, to get over there and, and grab him and hold him so he could tie him to a tree and whip him. But I couldn't do that. I stood there, frozen between the, the overseer and the slave. And it gave that slave just enough time to run away. 
That overseer, he was so mad. He picked up a two pound lead weight and he threw it at the runaway, but it missed. And it hit me instead. It tore my forehead wide open. I still bear the scar. I suffer from some real bad headaches and there's, there's times when I fall into a deep sleep and I, I can't wake up. Never know when these spells are coming on me. My folks were real scared that cause of my affliction. Master would sell me away and he tried real hard too. He brought white people to our cabin all times of day and night and they'd, they'd look at me and they'd, they'd poke at me. One man told my master that I wasn't even worth paying for, that he should give me away. It was then that I, I prayed again. I said, Lord, please, please convert master. Soften that man's heart. But if you ain't never going to change him, Lord, kill him. <laughs> Take him out of the way so he won't do no more mischief. Wasn't too many months after that that Master Brodus passed away. And it won't be long, and it won't be long, no, it won't be long for poor children to suffer here. Now, Master Brodus's heir was too young to take on the workings of a plantation, so they hired on a temporary master named Doc Thompson. Now, Doc Thompson, he, he hired me out to a builder named Master Stewart, at first, well, well, Master Stewart, he put me inside doing housework. But after a couple of months, I went to him and I pleaded. I told him that I, I knew more about mules and plows than I ever knew about the insides of a house. Well, at first, he didn't want to put me out there, but then he, well, he, he figured he'd be getting a bargain if and I could do them a man's job. Since I was a female, I didn't cost as much. So he agreed. Well, I worked outside from sun up to sundown, in the, in the rain and in the snow, in the heat and in the cold. My body grew strong and my muscles hardened. I could do the jobs that tax the strength of grown men. One day I was, I was working in the field by the road when, when a white woman in a wagon rode by. <laughs> she, she, she stopped and she, she watched me for a few moments. And then she, she, she motioned me to, to come here. And when I didn't, because I, I didn't know what to do, she, she motioned me closer. She asked me how I'd, how I'd come by that, that deep scar on my forehead. I told her what had happened to me, and well, she looked like it bothered her. She looked real angry. And then she told me to get just a little closer. And she said, if I ever needed any help, that I was to, to come to her, that she lived right down the road a couple of miles in Bucktown. And she said, as soon as I get into, in, into town, there'd be a big white house with green shutters, that I, I'd know the house right away. And then she told me, outside the house, by the road, there'd be a lamp. And if the lamp was lit, then it was safe for me to come and knock at the door. But if the lamp was dark, I was to wait in the woods. She told me I'd know just what to do. And then she just rode off like she never talked to me. Well, soon after that, times got harder and harder. Doc Thompson started selling slaves so he could pay his bills. Two of my sisters got sold down south on a chain gang. And you know what a horrible thing that is. It's when they chain the slaves at the ankles and sometimes at the neck. And they have to walk for miles and miles chained like this. See, that's when I knew it was time for me to run away. You see, I had reasoned it out in my mind that I had the right to one or two things, liberty or death. 
If I could not have one, I would have the other. For no man should take me alive. I, I should fight for my liberty as long as my strength lasted. And when it's time for me to go, well, then the Lord, he let him take me. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. Troubles of the world, the troubles of the world. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. Going home to live with God. No more weeping and a wailing. No more weeping and a wailing. No more weeping and a wailing. I'm going to live with God. I persuaded three of my brothers to come with me, but they were useless, frightened, no good in the brush. Well, once we got out there, they, they got so scared that they wanted to go back. Well, so we turned back, but I knew the next time I'd leave alone. Well, two couple of days later, word got back to me that Doc Thompson had sold me and my brothers to a Georgian trader, and we were to go south on a chain gang. <laughs> well, that was it. That night, I got in the quarter, and I, I, got, me some, <laughs> I got me some ash cake <laughs> and, and, and a goodly piece of salt herring, and I tied it. <laughs> in an old bandana, and I run them woods to Bucktown. <laughs> I came to that, to that woman's house, you know, the one that, that stopped and talked with me. And that lamp, it was lit. <laughs> but I didn't quite trust it, so I I circled around just to make sure. And then it was so quiet. Not a sound, not a dog barking, nothing. So I, I went up to that woman's house and I knocked at the door. I said, it's Harriet. From Doc Thompson's place. She wasn't even surprised to see me. She just, she just opened the door. Oh God, and she took me in. <laughs> My first night of freedom. <laughs> no more mistress call for me. No more, no more. No more mistress call from me, many thousand go. No more auction block for me, no more, thank you God, no more. No more auction block for me, many thousand go. The next morning, she wrote down a name on a slip of paper. That was the next place it was safe for me to go. And it took me to a big farmhouse with a tall white gate. And the people that lived there, they, they took me in, fed me, let me rest a spell. And then when they felt it was safe, then they took me on to the next stop. <laughs> That's when I realized that, that the Underground Railroad wasn't no real railroad train. That the, the Underground Railroad was a, a lot of good and brave people between the North and the South that didn't just talk about the hell slaves did then. But they jumped into the fire, and they pulled them out. <laughs> you gonna meet some of them fine folks on our journey together. Oh my Lord, he calls me. He calls me by the thunder. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal away, steal away. Steal away to Jesus, steal away, steal away home. <laughs> I ain't got long to stay here. I remember the first time I stepped on the dirt of the free state of Pennsylvania. 
I looked down at myself to see if I was the same person now that I was free. Oh, the trees and the fields had the look of gold. Oh, God, it was just like heaven. <laughs> but, well, then came the bitter drop in my cup of joy. See, I was alone. There was no one to welcome me into the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land, and my home was back there in the quarter with the old folks. My brothers and sisters, my whole family was still in slavery. That's when I realized in order for me to be truly happy, I'd have to have my family with me. So I decided then I'd have to go back to Dorchester County, who better than me, right? I'd done it before. The Lord, he'd let me do it again. I worked real hard for about a year in a hotel in, in Philadelphia, cooking, cleaning, trying to make enough money to go back and get my family. I found out about the, the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. Now, eventually, all the runaways ended up there for one reason or another. Food, money, helped to get started on this new life. Oh, I made many trips back and forth to that office, listening to all the stories a man named William Still would tell me. He was the secretary of the Vigilance Committee. Well, he told me about, about a man that his wife and his children were in slavery back in Maryland. And they were trying to figure out who they could, could send to, to help him back. And I told him, I'll do it. And he said, no, no. Well, he was afraid for me because he knew that, well, there'd be a bounty on my head. And, and they'd probably hang me. But I told him, freedom don't come cheap. And I told him I'd go. So I went back, and I got them people. And it turned into this, <laughs> me going back and getting y'all. You see, when y'all get up to freedom and you get to work, and you get to live like all people in this country deserve to live. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't deserve freedom, because you do. And when you get up there and you live like everybody else, don't forget where you came from. Don't take it for granted. Too many people have done too much, paid too high a price for you to take this freedom for granted. Now, I keep you all here telling your stories all night long. We got to get some rest before we start on our journey. Now, you're going to have to be quiet, and you're going to have to listen to everything I say. You won't be able to ask me no questions when we get started on the road. So if anybody's got something that they want to ask Moses, now's the time to do it, because when I say quiet, I mean quiet. So anybody got any questions that they want to ask me now before, before you rest the spell and we get going in a couple of hours? I'm Angela Rice Beamer here with Gwendolyn Briley Strand, who's just performed as Harriet Tubman. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining oh, us. I'm you. very glad you're back. You're uh, welcome. It's good to be back. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the new scholarship that mm -hmm. has come out now. Mm -hmm. Some of the things have changed. There were some myths that have been clarified. Right, right. It's so wonderful and it's very interesting. Um, the, as far as uh, her birth date, we never really were quite sure what year Harriet Tubman was born in. Um, they had this um, span of time from 1820 to 1825, and most everybody sort of um, got in on that 1820. Um, uh, but they found out that she was born in 1822, and that's because um, Dr. Larson, Kay Clifford Larson, in her book, she tells about a finding a receipt for a midwife that helped um, Rit, who was Harriet's mother, birth a baby girl. 
So they're thinking that that might be when Harriet was born, so that the number of passengers, the number of trips that she took, instead of the 19, there was only 11, maybe 11 to 13 trips, uh, instead of 300 people. Well, it started as 1,000 people, then 300 people. But they're saying um, about 70 people. So a lot of the, the, the different myths there, they're finding evidence and they're trying to document um, proof of all of these things. A lot of people are kind of disappointed with the number of people, but I think the fact she came back one time is amazing. Like I told my audience, I don't know if Gwen would have. Maybe she would have, but I don't know. <laughs> because at one point, wasn't there a $40,000 bounty on her head? Well, yeah, they, 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 that was, an, I think, another one of the myths. Um, because now we have um, uh, proof of a wanted poster where um, there was $300. And they have, I think they, they can go up to about 12000 with her, but no longer the 40000 but really. You know, wanted dead or alive, they wanted her. She was stealing their, she was a thief. She was stealing their property. Their people, mm -hmm. as Jefferson right. Davis mentioned, he, he called his slaves my people. Right, his people, his property, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there, uh, going along with that same myth thing, there was another thing I read that she walked to freedom. And you mentioned in your performance, like she, did, she just walked away mm -hmm. and didn't have help. But there were abolitionists that oh, helped yes. her get out that first time. Yes, yes, there really were. Um, uh, she didn't really know which way to go. And so with that woman that talked, that, that Quaker woman that addressed her the first time and told her to go to this house. So she went there and then, you know, it was the station masters, they, they told her where to go all the way. And so she, she was smart and she kept to the same routes all the, the way, but she had help. Yeah. Um, after seeing your performance uh, up here at Chautauqua in Maryland, several years ago, mm -hmm. I, it sort of brought Harriet Tubman to mind and that idea of following the North Star. Mm -hmm. When I get out of my car sometimes in my driveway, I look up and I identify, where is that North ah. Star? And I think of Harriet Tubman. Oh, as good, good. good, yes, yes, that's what, you know, she really believed in following the, the North Star and, and, and then, you know, using her friends, her station masters that helped her. Now, it, there, it, there's something really important about being able to tell your own story. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, she told the story, but it was written down by something else. I th there's th you, you mentioned in the question and answer mm -hmm. section about uh, the, the sort of the importance of education. And, and you told right. a story about her when she saw a warranted poster of herself. Mm -hmm. Can you tell that story? Right. Uh, she, she came across a, a wanted poster and everyone was reading about it and it described her. It described she was short, a short statue. She had a scar on her, uh, her head and, uh, and that she was illiterate. And so what she did, she barreled through the crowd and she just started and she let her mouth and she, you know, so they, oh, well, she can read, so that can't be, yeah, because they all looked alike, so, you know, that can't be. So it was, she was always thinking and um, she had, she was always praying and always listening for the voice of God to give her direction uh, on how to, to do this mission, this job that he had, you know, given her to do. Ken, is it possible to separate Harriet Tubman from her faith? I don't think so. I, I, I really don't think so. I think because even as a child, her, her parents, you know, always told her to, to trust in God. And, and they, they would, she would have people read the Bible to her. She almost had it committed to memory that she would have people. And she followed the word. It was her God she had a relationship with. And she was close and she would listen to it and she would, she would speak the words of the Bible. And she believed in her heart. She, and she was a firm believer. The Bible said, first you must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek. So she, she would speak the words from the Bible because she hid them in her heart. So I don't think there's any way to separate Harriet from her faith. It would, they're interwoven. They're, it's a part of her. Now, she, her, 
she changed her name from Araminta, mm -hmm. a, a name that I've come to like very much, very yeah, unusual, it's a to name. Harriet. And why mm -hmm. did she change her name well, to Harriet? I, I, they're anticipating she, she probably changed it. First, we thought it was during her teen years, but we're thinking probably just before she got married. Uh, she changed her, her name to from Araminta because then uh, most of the people called her Menti. And that was such a child's name. And she was a woman now and had a husband. So uh, she took on her mother's name, Harriet. And she actually had two husbands in her life. Yes. One was, was uh, John Tubman. Mm -hmm. That was her first mm -hmm. husband. And then her second husband, Nelson Davis. Two husbands. And yeah. da Davis was uh, in the uh, civil, had fought in the Civil War? Right. He was a, a military man. And he was sick. He had uh, suffered from tuberculosis. So he really um, was out on his own. And she ended up taking him into the John Brown Hall, the, the home that she had. Uh, he wasn't well. And he, she outlived both of her husbands. Both of her husbands. And she lived to the age of 90. 91. What, 91. Oh, my what, goodness. Which, yeah. if, which if in, in those days, with the type of medical care, the type of life she had to lead, outdoors Amazing. running. Hit, you know, right, with, the, the, the blow to the head, mm -hmm. and she suffered from uh, rheumatism and arthritis and so many things. She and caught, narcolepsy. You know, yeah, the narcolepsy from the blow to the head. So that was, you know, so many different things. And being out in the elements, uh, she caught pneumonia. And that's how she died, from, from catching pneumonia. But she was obviously a strong woman. And she knew that she would, you know, just keep going until she couldn't go any farther. And she really lived a life of service. Yes. Uh, to, to so many, uh, not just the people she helped escape, but as a nurse. As Tell a nurse. A uh, still, oh, she, I mean, that's one thing that I admire about her life of service. She served people. She served God and she served people. She took care of the, the colored soldiers, the contraband that they called them, that, that came into the Union um, camps um, because a lot of the white soldiers, um, white nurses didn't take care of them. So she took care of them. Uh, she took care of uh, her passengers on the Underground Railroad. So, uh, and there was a time when there was a uh, there was this um, r uh, big uh, epidemic of dysentery that was on uh, at one of the Union um, camps uh, down in northern Florida, so southern South Carolina. And she went down there because the doctor, the Union doctor, had gotten sick and he was dying. And she went down there and made up a concoction with that her her um, mother had taught her to make it. She made that up. She cured him, taught him how to make it. Then he gave it to everyone else, and people started getting better. Then she went back up uh, north into Virginia to work at Fortress Monroe and all of these different places as a nurse, taking care of people. How did she get into the South? Places like South Carolina and Florida, and mm -hmm. how did she? How, did they smuggle her in? How well, they, she 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 was what? sent down there by um, the governor of Massachusetts to serve as a, a spy. And so a she scout. went with the troops, right? She was sent. Well, she was supposed to. She was supposed to travel with um, one of the uh, military men, and she decided he was going too slow. She went down on her own. Uh, she took a train. She was, you know, able to 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 go down and see the war was going, and she had to be careful because even though the the war was going on and supposedly, you know, there was a, a lot of future to people just leaving plantations, the contraband, as they call them, just leaving the plantations. She didn't want to be captured and taken, you know, farther south. So a lot of times she would pretend she was going to uh, a, a specific plantation with a specific master to, to make her way around till she could get to the, um, uh, to the Union camp where she was supposed to be. How long have you performed Harriet Tubman? My, I've been doing Harriet almost 20 years now. I've been traveling with my show, The Chosen One, about 17. In that time, have you incorporated things, qualities mm -hmm. that Harriet Tubman has into your own life? Oh, my. Um, I guess her, <laughs> the tenacity that she had. I, I, yeah, but I think that was a part of Gwen all along, but she, the fact that she had so little and gave so much, 
it makes you as a person want to do more want to do more in your neighborhood and your schools and and just so I think I've taken that on and I love serving and working with people also and um, I've just become um, really passionate about um, teaching and performing history and teaching in the performance uh, because this is American history that needs to be taught all the time not just in I'm very grateful for for February and I remember my mother always tell me listen I, she only had Negro History Week she says you know now you've got you know Black History Month so be grateful so I, 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 I am grateful but I think I want it to be taught as American history all the time I want my African American children to have a sense of pride in their ancestors and their, I hear so many of them, they will say, oh, well, I wouldn't have been no slave. As if our ancestors chose slavery. Oh, slavery, I'll take that. You know, not realizing that we survived the impossible in this, 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 this journey that black people have gone through. And, and I want them to know that, take a sense of pride in their history and so many we've stopped the the griot the telling of our story we've stopped doing it so if i can just continue telling the story and inspiring young people to and and of all races to to know that this is a great country it's full of wonderful stories and great people people who've worked so hard so through hard. tremendous odds and still made it. So <sighs> the, it, learning it. from history can be so important. And I think that idea of living history, mm -hmm. uh, to actually see a person who's dressed yes. in a period costume, moving around, and and, and taking questions right. from the real Right, and audience. it comes to life for them. It's not just names and dates on a page that they have to memorize, and it's, you know, oh, history. But if it makes it fun, and, and to know uh, that these people had whole lives, they had children that maybe didn't act right or did act right. They had husbands that loved them or didn't. I mean, life. They went through and lived a life. And, and what's exciting to do is to, is to know that, you know, they knew each other. You know, we learn about separate people, but to know that people met, you know, Frederick Douglass and, and Harriet had met up, that she never got a chance to meet Lincoln, and that she had a bone to pick with Lincoln. What and was all that? of that. What was the bone to well, pick she, with Well, the thing is that uh, she thought that Lincoln was just vacillating too much with emancipating the slaves, that he didn't want to just set them free, and she was you know, for that right away. Um, she also was very angry that the colored soldiers did, got paid half. I, th I believe they made $7 while the white soldiers made 15 And that was, you know, she knew that wasn't right. And there was still, there was still so much. She felt so much to do for her people, you know, even they were emancipated, but what now? What now? You know, now we need education. We need them to, to be able to get into the fabric, working into the fabric of the country, in the government, and all of this to become the, the citizens that they deserve to be. And it, it, um, among the other things of service that we didn't mention, she also took in some children and treated them as her own. She did. She took in, she, I mean, she took in people, John Brown home, she took in the seniors. She was a servant, and I think she's just going to be if not now already, will be highly rewarded in heaven for all that she did, for all, for everyone. How did you come to pick her among other, all the other? Mm. You know, I think Harriet picked me. Um, I love doing Miss Truth. I really did. Was she one of your first? Yes, so she, she was, was first. right. Okay. She was one of my first. But I'm physically more Harriet. Miss Truth was six feet tall, you know, she was tall, 90 pounds, sick and wet, you know, soaking wet. She was, uh, you know, very thin. But Harriet was short in stature, stocky, um, and just the spirit of Harriet and that foot soldier, that warrior spirit, that's what I, I really loved about, about Harriet. Um, I loved um, doing Rosa Parks, too. Yes. The two of them, um, 
have so much in common. And I, I, I think just the fact when the, they're, they're crossing in time, because Harriet died in 1913, and Rosa Parks was born in 1913. Isn't you know, February, thing? March, they handed the gauntlet off. You know, Harriet, when she went home and left this earth, you know, Rosa was just coming in, so the two of them. But uh, I think Harriet sort of picked me, I auditioned for, and I got the role, and, and, but the more I learned about her, the more I just became intrigued with her, and I loved the strength of her faith, the strength of her, uh, and that's something that, a, a place I can relate from that I can, because I love the Lord so much myself. So to know that she was just this warrior for God, I said, yeah, maybe I can, I can do that too. Yeah, you can, you can put on that. Uh, right, the, put that mantle clothes. on, right, I can do that too, yeah, yeah. Are there characters that you would like to do that you've sort, you've sort of got your eye on that you haven't uh, started to research yet? Um, I, well, I've done a lot. I love the character of Ida B. Wells. Her I would like to do, and Barbara Jordan. Those are two. Uh, Harry keeps me so busy. Uh, I've done a lot of research on Ida B. Wells, which I'd like to do, and that's, she would be a difficult person because she dealt with the lynching of black men. Um, so that's a, a difficult um, subject, but I like difficult subjects to talk about, and they need to know. Barbara Jordan is an amazing, amazing woman to do. So those are some characters if, if Harriet ever gives me a break. Right. And it seems to probably grow and grow. More. It does. Especially now in Maryland now that there's legislation right, pending. Right, right. And it's growing all over the country um, because uh, we're very blessed here in this Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New York area. We're really rich in history and, and we seem to, to, to put more on. The farther west I go, it's, you know, they don't hear the story. So I'm anxious to get, you know, farther out. I've been so many places. Blessed to be so many. I've been just within the past couple of months, been up in New Jersey, Iowa, Arkansas, all of these places. So I'm anxious to get out into the Midwest. And Speaking of New Jersey, I did not know, I read something about the fact that Harriet Tubman worked in New, in Cape May, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was kind of surprised about the New Jersey stop before right. she got to New York. Right, she would go, you know, all the way. She, she was, she was amazing. Are you familiar with a book called Song Yet Sung? That was a Maryland One book mm -hmm. a few years ago. Yes, and I haven't read it, but I've heard such wonderful things about it. Yeah, I can't wait to. That's, yeah. That same Eastern Shore mm -hmm. area, uh, and, and, and it's about slaves uh, mm -hmm. running away, one in, in particular, and, and the people that helped her along the way. Right. And I think you would love it. Yeah, right? I but, but it's so descriptive of that Eastern Shore area, mm -hmm. the same area Harriet That, Tubman that Harriet from. and Frederick Douglass, he's yes. from Talbert County. Yes. Right, so, and, and that's what um, I think needs to get across that these people had help. And we, we, you know, and we've sort of lost that, that community of helping people, you know, crossing ethnic lines and all that, and helping each other as Americans. So that's, uh, yeah, I can't wait to read that book, though. Especially in terms of a community. I, I mm -hmm. think that there, we, we are uh, fortunate, in a sense, to get so much international news, national news. Right. But do we go out of our homes to And do we talk? help our neighbors? Yes. Do we talk with that? And, and young people were so, I love technology. I think it's a wonderful thing. But do we have relationships? We're so busy texting and so busy on Facebook and all of these other um, social networks, which are nice. And, and I love using them for business and to keep you know, in touch with people. But it's something about touching someone is something about my kids know that my son uh, on the west coast he knows I want to hear his voice call me don't text me you know but call me so um, and we, we, we've lost the, the like you say the community you know and we've got to get back to the church community the school community the neighborhoods do you know all of your neighbors names we used to we used to Th that's one 
nice thing about Chautauqua. It begins to get people sort of out of their homes. It is the community. It's not yes. exactly uh, the, the next step that we need to go, but it is a beginning. Oh, it's a wonderful yeah. beginning, and I hope that it just keeps growing, and it has grown over the years. Excellent. It Excellent. has grown. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So much. You're Look forward welcome. to seeing you again soon as, Thank as you. another character as Harriet again. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. You've been watching Chautauqua, the American Civil War, A House Divided. I'm here at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College and for all of us here at Germantown, good night. Well, it rained all day, the night I left, the weather, it was dry. The sun so hot, I froze to death. Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, now don't you cry for me. For I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Actually, I live in downtown Washington. <laughs> <laughs>